If you want to continue keeping your team alive and healthy with your powerful tools on Mercy, you've come to the right place. So let's get right into it. Mercy is seen as one of the easiest supports in Overwatch, but she is deceivingly simple and rather quite difficult once one begins to learn her capabilities. Equipped with incredible mobility, there is a clear barrier between a decent Mercy and a fantastic Mercy. The utility she packs within her kit has the ability to sway the course of the game alongside her teammates, but with great power comes a great deal of care, skill, and responsibility. If you are new around here, you may want to stick around in order to understand how my guides work in comparison to others. If you have been around the block though, there will be a timestamp on the screen as well as in the description to jump right into the guide content. I appreciate the feedback from from previous guides in the comments, but anyways, what is this guide going to have that is different from something you'd find somewhere else? This is indeed a comprehensive guide, so there are definitely players from all over that will end up watching this video in the future. So I'm going to go really in depth with this character. Many guides go into detail about mercy within ladder, which is perfectly reasonable. However, within this video we will not only accomplish this, but go in depth about how she fits into a scrim setting. In order to do this, allow me to introduce myself to you. My name is Paz and I am a top 500 flex support player. Throughout the years, I have accumulated many top finishes within a multitude of teams, including attack mode and the team at Penn State University. While I may not play Mercy every single day, I have to understand how the character functions in order to react accordingly, especially when playing characters like Ana and Zenyatta alongside her. This video will also be vetted intensely by Poketude, one of the coaches currently for Altiora, a team that recently played in Contenders. Poke is incredibly smart and has taught me extensively about all of the supports during my time at attack mode, allowing me to create the previous guides you see on screen. I strongly recommend giving him a follow on his Twitter, as there is always something to learn from him. Moving on, throughout the guide, we will go over all of the concepts I have listed in the description in a staircase structure. For instance, with Mercy's Caduceus staff, we will start off with the basics and work our way up to the advanced concepts like understanding when it is time to apply the yellow and blue beams in niche situations to influence breakpoints. She did just get reworked for Overwatch 2, so the educational content today will adhere to the changes seen there along with 5v5. Not too much has changed, but enough has to make it worth mentioning. Wait until the end of the video to make your judgment, but if you do learn something or find value in today's guide, consider subscribing and giving the video a like. I appreciate you all, and with that all out of the way, let's start with her primary, the Caduceus Staff. Mercy's primary staff has two firing modes, one that heals for 55 points per second and one that applies a 30% damage boost to a single target at a time. This mechanic is pretty simple and doesn't take a whole lot of learning which does what, but something that is important to note is that the range of both beams is 15 meters, so keep this in mind when placing yourself alongside your team. By default, you have to hold the beam on your teammates. However, there is a setting to set the beam to toggle so that you only have to tap your teammates once with the beam. I find this helps me out a lot with movement as Mercy as I can whip my mouse around a lot faster without having to worry about disconnecting the beam. Another mechanic of the beam that is not talked about too often is about how it reacts to line of sight being broken. Contrary to popular belief, it isn't broken immediately, but rather 1.3 seconds afterwards. This can be helpful when using specific settings with your flight ability, Guardian Angel, Angel, but we will cover that part when we get there. Keep in mind as well that all that is needed to maintain the beam is a few jiggle peaks to keep yourself safe as well. Sometimes using your beam can actually be detrimental to your team though, specifically when somebody is on a flank. I cannot tell you how many times I have seen a fantastic flank just for a mercy to reveal them losing the fight. It is really heartbreaking because if they had just waited to beam a second later, the result would have been a swift fight win. Make sure you aren't heal botting either. Damage boost and mobility are the only thing Things that set Mercy apart from other supports. At the end of the day, why play her over Brig that is more reliable and is a sentinel in the backline? The only answer is to influence breakpoints. In other words, critical aspects of fights that cause one team to win over the other. Mercy allows some characters to create considerable value like Ash, Farah, and Echo. Ash does a ton of damage on her own, but with a pocket, it's a whole different story, stacking tons of burn potential with her dynamite. On top of that, damage boost makes a headshot go from 150 to 195 damage, which is not technically, but effectively a one-shot. Farah is terrible without a mercy, but when the duo is together, they dominate maps if left untouched. Echo is strong when played with Brigitte and Zenyatta, but absolutely busted when played with a mercy, especially in ranked. 
This doesn't mean you should never heal, just look for damage when opportunities present themselves. Is your soldier or Genji ulting? Damage boost them. For Genji Blade, it only does 110 a slice and 50 on a dash for a total of 160 damage. But with damage boost active, his blade slices for 143 and dashes for 65, which totals to 208, enough to one shot a squishy. This gives enough of a damage boost to hit the same breakpoint of that of Nano without using an ultimate, which is absolutely insane. Did your hog hit a huge hook? Damage boost him. Is your Zen using transcendence? Damage boost your team, since healing is going to be pretty much negligible. At lower elos and even higher elos, playing DPS when the enemy has mercy and you don't makes the game nearly unplayable. This is all because of damage boost alongside some heals on top of that, so don't underestimate the power of mercy. One last thing to cover about damage boost is that you can use it on characters you wouldn't normally pocket in order to get them their ultimates faster. Maybe your Sigma or Zarya are super close to charging up and just need a little bit of a boost to push them over the edge. This can make a big difference, especially when we are talking about some of the strongest ultimates in the game. Mercy's Glock, I mean, sidearm, shoots projectile pellets that shoot and travel pretty slow but pack a punch of 20 damage per hit when needed. The hitbox of this projectile is pretty forgiving, which is nice considering a lot of your time when learning Mercy is going to be focused on her mobility. However, I know a few players are going to have this question. When is the right time to pull out the Glock? What you have to understand is that damage boosting a friendly teammate is almost always going to yield to more damage. More damage means faster ultimates for your team, which means winning more fights in the future. The only time you are going to pull out your pistol is when you are Valking, which we will cover later, or when a target just barely gets out of reach of your team where you can use your Guardian Angel ability to catch up on the enemy. So let's move on to what gives Mercy her amazing mobility, Guardian Angel and Angelic Descent. Angelic Descent is one of her two passives. Instead of falling immediately downward, Mercy has the option to slowly descend. Keep in mind that this is an option and not a requirement. You can still fall down at the speed of gravity if you wish. Whether or not you should fall quickly or slowly depends on what the enemy is running. If they are running characters like Zarya, Reinhardt, Doomfist, and Reaper, or anything else that struggles catching you in the air, flying around in the sky isn't a problem. You can mitigate dying in a neutral fight with no ultimates as well as evade them when they come online. After all, you can't get shattered if you're in the air. You don't want to glide all the time though as it sometimes is detrimental. For example, you don't want to float against D.Va, Widowmaker, or any hit scans really. Floating makes you an incredibly easy target to hit. If you have to fly to avoid a shatter or a rush that is incoming on the ground, make sure you are mitigating how much you are exposing yourself by floating around walls. Keep in mind that when you hold glide it actually extends your hitbox as well, but you can feather tap if you want to keep it small. Let's talk about Guardian Angel or GA for short. With a max range of a whopping 30 meters, Mercy can fly to a friendly target across the map at a speed of 17 meters per second, even if they are a soul and not alive. While the ability is simple and can be used often, there are a lot of cool things you can do with this ability. I am by no means a Mercy god, but I can show you a few things you can do with GA, starting with the easiest to hardest techniques to perform. First off, if you accidentally begin your flight, you can press GA again to immediately stop your flight in place. The last thing you want to do is fly straight into the front line where all the action is happening. No one is perfect, especially when first learning the character, so this can be a pretty helpful thing to know, especially when staying lower and hovering alongside a Pharah. Much like Doomfist's punch, you can jump mid-flight to propel yourself forward. This technique is really helpful in a lot of situations. For example, when trying to evade an aggressive Genji blade, you can play just far enough from a teammate so that when the Genji dashes on you, you can fly at the same time. If you time this perfectly, the Genji will lose his dash as well as the ability to kill the rest of your team. Next up, we have the infamous super jump. Let's learn this three-step process. First, find a GA target and fly and crouch at the same time. Then, as you approach the target, you will see Mercy take a dip in her flight pattern. It may not seem obvious, but look at the normal pattern alongside the super jump. Lastly, as soon as the dip begins to shift upwards, jump. It took me a little bit to get this down, but it is really useful situationally. Before we talk about those situations though, I know for a bunch of players that this technique isn't as easy as it looks. Switching keybinds might be the way to go. I personally use the default settings on Mercy, but I have heard other players finding success in binding their jump or crouch to their mouse buttons. My console audience might struggle a little bit more considering the button layout is 11 
less than favorable. Personally, when I played on console, I found it easier to bind either crouch or jump to my left analog stick when I push it in. This command is called L3. I do this because it disconnected all of the work from my right hand that had a focus on the crouch action. So why is super jump even useful? Well, there are a multitude of reasons. One is to go to different high grounds throughout the game even when you don't have a teammate located there. This is very common when you aren't playing with the Pharah or Echo, and sometimes your survivability depends on it. Another way super jump can be useful is during quick resurrections. We will talk about this more in depth soon, but super jumping during a res can provide that little bit of extra mobility needed to pull it off. It is important you don't jump around whenever you want to though. Just like floating around, jumping in the air out of cover can leave you more exposed to hit scans for easy shots. Sure, you can evade Reapers and Doomfists, but keep in mind that this changes from game to game. Up next is Mercy's backwards jump. This is by far the most difficult technique to pull off and will require the most practice. If you use GA, jump, and move backwards at the same time, you will actually be able to launch yourself backwards, even if you aren't beaming the target behind you. This can also be combined with super jump for some increased complexity. Look at how crazy this looks though. This will throw off even the best DPS in the game, I promise you. If you have the time, learn this. It will definitely become useful someday and win you a ton of games. There are some very, very useful codes that I will also link in the description to help you all learn these movement techs. It's worth the practice. Overwatch 2's beta brought even more movement options for Mercy. Since Super Jump was changed and is now a standalone ability, there's more you can do with it. First off, you can fly indefinitely in the air if you crouch immediately after triggering GA on a ground target. Another technique that is now available is something called the Mega Jump where you stand right next to your target and launch yourself much higher than the normal super jump. While these were in the first beta, it's not guaranteed that these will carry over to the second beta, so it is still a good idea to learn all of the Overwatch 1 Mercy techniques so you're ready for anything. Last but not least, let's move on to our last Guardian Angel topic. Which setting should you be using for Guardian Angel target priority? While there have been debates in the past about which one to use, they've recently added a newer setting that is a clear winner, Prefer Facing Targets. This allows you to get the best of both worlds when flying around the map as Mercy. You get all of the control to fly to specific targets when you need to without giving up the convenience of preferred beam target when flying with an Echo or Pharah. It also allows you to fly to your beam target through a wall for extra evasive mobility. This setting is by far the best option. Aside from techniques, there are ways to communicate Guardian Angel usage as well. Specifically, if you died and are looking to get back to spawn faster, let your team know. This can help you take more fights throughout the game, increasing your chances of winning. <sighs> okay, I think that was everything for this ability, let's move on to Resurrect. The Resurrect ability, otherwise known as Res, does exactly what it says it does, revives a teammate from the grave once every 30 seconds. When a player activates Mercy's Res, it takes about 2 seconds to complete and movement speed is reduced by 75%. This is why super jumping while resing can be beneficial at times as your carried momentum from the jump is harder to track and kill compared to just standing still. Sometimes just avoiding exposing yourself from the enemy is the right call though, as line of sight does not need to be maintained once the initial res is cast. The the only thing that needs to be maintained is the distance from the target, which is about 5 to 7 meters. So make sure you aren't exposed to characters with strong CC abilities, as a simple boop is all that is needed to cancel that res, immediately putting it back on that 30 second cooldown. Contrary to popular belief, you shouldn't res whenever you have the opportunity to. Every fight is a new situation with moving variables that have to be accounted for. Before resurrecting, think about these things. Is it safe to resurrect this teammate? How close is this orb to spawn, or is it respawning soon? Is there a better target? Is the fight already lost? Sometimes the res you are going for is a bit of a stretch. That doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't go for it though. It might just mean that you need a little bit more help from your team to make sure it goes through. Maybe it's a bubble, or maybe your D.Va's defense matrix, which conveniently has an uptime of 2 seconds, the perfect amount of time to pull off a res. Next, if the res is right next to spawn, it might be more beneficial to hold off so you have it for the fight after. This concept also applies if your teammate is considering swapping. This means that the res is actually counterintuitive and only wasting more time. Now let's talk about res targets. How can you decipher which one is the best to resurrect? There are two variables of play here, how safe the res is and how crucial the character is to your win condition that fight. For example, let's say you have two options. One soul is your Zarya that died with Grav, while the other is your Genji that is halfway to blade. 
The Zarya's res is far more valuable than the Genji res. Knowing this, you should be more willing to take the risk on the Zarya than the Genji. I don't mean you should rush into risk at your earliest convenience, but if a res is that crucial, you need to call out to your team to support you. Maybe you have a Reinhardt that is able to give you a shield to get your Zarya up just in time so that even if you die, you can grab Dragon and clean up afterwards. This idea is very difficult to grasp, but at the end of the day, it just comes down to playing the game and thinking about it. It is always a balancing act between danger of the res and the value that's provided by the outcome. Last but not least, is the fight already lost? I see this a lot even in GM. Mercies love to res when the fight is over in an attempt to clutch up, but it does a lot more harm than you realize. That res on your Roadhog might seem small, but that is just free ultimate charge for the enemy. What if the enemy Genji just needed a little bit more to his blade and that gave it to him? Useless reses like this can be avoided to make the game harder for your enemy. Forcing the enemy Genji to get blade before the fight can bait him into making a mistake, giving you a fight win that may have otherwise been lost. These sections typically get pretty hard to understand though, so if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Let's move on to Mercy's ultimate though, Valkyrie. Valkyrie or Valk is a roaming ultimate that gives Mercy the ability to fly without falling for 15 seconds with a slew of other benefits. First off, her beam goes from being a single target effect to a chain effect that applies to all allies within the 10 meter radius of the initial connection of the host ally. The damage boost applied is still a 30% buff, while the healing goes from 55 per second to 60 per second. Even though this is an increase in healing, the damage option is vastly better as targets die much faster, meaning your team will take less damage overall as targets begin to fall. You'll notice that Mercy moves a lot faster in her ultimate as well, especially in GA. She straight up zooms when in GA, so there is no reason you should really be dying in this ultimate. A common mistake though that leads players into Demise, however, is immediately flying as high as they possibly can upon casting this ultimate. This exposes you to Diva Bombs and enemy hit scans, especially when ultimates like Soldier's Visor and Cassidy's High Noon are typically held when Mercy's cast this ultimate. So make sure you place yourself off of the ground, but not so high up that you're hurting yourself. Mercy's movement speed isn't the only thing that amps up the pace when Valk is active. Her Glock shoots twice as fast with infinite amp ammo as well. This is your time to put your bad bitch energy to good use. If the enemy has an oppressive widow, you can use one of your teammates to catapult yourself into her and duel her with your increased speed and damage potential. So long as you are strafing, you are nearly impossible to hit and the quick little pick will alleviate a lot of stress for your team. Don't get carried away though. At the end of the day, a full team with damage boost is a much larger threat for your enemy to deal with. So make sure you are using Valk to its strengths. Zenyatta's Transcendence heals for 200 per second, which is far more than what Mercy's ultimate can. So make sure you don't get trapped into using it as such. Valk can react accordingly to the flow of tempo most fights throw at it. It isn't a great engagement tool or defensive tool, but rather something to be used once the optimal position has been found with your team activated and ready to perform, shifting the fight heavily into your favor. Thus, timing is difficult, but with all of these moving parts in mind, this should guide you into better Valks with the character. Let's move on to the final ability we will talk about today, which is her regeneration passive. You might be wondering why I waited to put regen at the end of the micro guide of this list, but in my opinion, it was for good reason. Regen is the ability that received the largest change upon the release of the first Overwatch 2 beta. In Overwatch 1, the ability heals for 20 health per second after being out of combat for one second. In Overwatch 2, Mercy's passive heals for 30 health per second, 50% more than that of Overwatch 1. While in Valk, her regen does not get interrupted by taking damage, which is really nice as it makes her a bit tankier in theory, helping her pull off those risky resurrections. So why does this matter? It plays an important role in her synergies with her secondary support. She doesn't really need all that much help. With the proper setup and solid movement, a Mercy can sustain herself as opposed to Ana, that needs a little bit more help. This is why she works well with characters like Zenyatta. So let's talk about that in our next section, covering win conditions. A win condition is a way in which a team can win a team fight. Obviously, there are many different possible win conditions for each and every team fight, but there are some that are more effective and efficient than others. That is, there are ways to win a fight by using a minimal amount of ultimates to get the maximum value needed. So let's talk about two compositions where Mercy could be played, powerful win conditions within the compositions themselves, and how the win conditions interact with different compositions. The first composition we will go over is a poke-centric comp. This comp will include Wrecking Ball, Sigma, Ash, Echo, Mercy, and Zenyatta. 
This comp wants to take strong angles and slowly deplete their enemy's health pool before they are even touched. That is their basic win condition. In terms of ultimates, Flux is an incredible engagement tool as well as a strong defensive tool if Zenyatta doesn't have transcendence for every situation. Echo's duplication can also swing fights within the right hands, and Bob is the same way. As the Mercy player, your role might surprise you. You may think that the composition has a lack of healing, but think about it, is it really needed? Your Wrecking Ball will be taking most of the damage, but health packs are easily accepted accessible to this character, with Zenyatta's orb being an added bonus. Thus, healing your tanks really isn't a problem as Mercy. Rather, your goal should be to support the DPS with damage boost as much as possible, cleaning the enemy up, leaving your team unscathed. The second composition we will cover is a bit of a niche one that doesn't have a true backline. This comp will include Wrecking Ball, D.Va, Tracer, Farah, Mercy, and Lucio. This comp seeks to avoid the struggle of keeping a backline alive, shifting the focus on just making sure supports are alive to begin with. This this allows the team to prolong the fights and poke the enemy just out of their reach. That is their basic win condition. While there aren't any crazy ultimate combos within the comp, the pharmacy is the main focus of the damage within this team. Whatever the Pharah manages to hit directly with a rocket should be the main focus for the entire team, as it deals a ton of damage up front, making cleanup a breeze. Again, healing isn't too much of an issue, since most of these characters have the mobility to survive off health packs and cover. Now let's talk about how these compositions interact against each other for Mercy. While this matchup is far from conventional, when playing Mercy with the Zen Comp, you have more liberty to fly around in the open. That doesn't mean that you should fly into the enemy team, just know that you have more space since there is no hitscan presence to worry about. You can also avoid Farah's splash damage in the air. You will play to damage boost whichever DPS is dueling the Farah at any given moment. The only thing you should specifically look out for is keeping your Zen alive, as the enemy will try to dive him often. If your DPS aren't able to consistently shred the Farah, the Zen will have a lot of pressure to deal with, making a switch to, dare I say it, Brigitte, a good call. On the other side of the matchup, you should focus on simply staying alive while supporting your Farah. So long as your Farah can exist, it should give your Ball and Tracer enough time to find the enemy Zenyatta and eliminate him. What I will say is that Mercy is a lot more difficult to play in this composition compared to the one above, as she has a lot more threats to deal with. Echo and Ash don't play around on their own. Damage boost applied to this duo makes them a horrifying experience to play against. Wing conditions can be hard to understand, so if you are still confused on this subject, let me know in the comments down below if you'd like me to make a video about it. If you have any questions, you can also join our Discord server with many players just like you and ask me questions when I'm not live. Link in the description. With win conditions out of the way, let's talk about positioning. Because Mercy Beam is relatively simplistic, a major portion of her utility and value really comes from her positioning and res. Understanding how to move around the map safely and quickly to get to the people that you need to support is vital in order to master Mercy. It is pretty simple at face value, but positioning can get really tricky if the player is lackadaisical in their movement. A lot of it comes down to playing within the line of sight of your team, as well as keeping yourself safe around cover. Make sure that you aren't playing so far back that you can't GA to your team, but not so close that you are taking cleave damage from the enemy frontline. Survivability isn't super hard for Mercy, and it all comes down to making sure you feel comfortable with the different moving parts of her kit. To finish off the guide, where are you going to see Mercy in high level team play? To be quite honest, at least currently, it is difficult to advocate for her in really high level games, as Brigitte functions a lot better in most compositions. However, if you aren't playing in top 500, you could argue that Mercy finds value in a few places. A lot of this comes down from her synergies with spam-centric characters within the comps we took a bit of a look at earlier. If you need a recap on those comps, there's a chapter marker for you in the description to find them quickly. The characters I like to duo with the most in Ladder as Mercy include Ash, Echo, Farah, Ana, Zenyatta, and maybe even Roadhog. Ash still does a lot with a Mercy Pocket. An amplified dynamite strike on the enemy immediately swings the fight into your favor. Echo is strong without a pocket, but with a pocket, problems begin to emerge as she is incredibly strong. The Pharmacy duo is an age-old classic, especially in lower ranks where D.Va isn't commonly picked and hit scams aren't super precise. Zenyatta is incredibly strong to deal crazy damage, but Ana is more consistent for latter scenarios as your tanks won't always be careful with their HP pool. Lastly, I recommend Roadhog if you're looking to pub stomped ranked, as he doesn't need a lot of healing and damage boosting his hooks secures kills most of the time. And with that, the guide comes to an end, but let's finish it all off with some role clarifications and key takeaways. Since Mercy is considered a main support, generally it is the Mercy player's job to track ultimates. 
The reason this is at the end of the video rather than the middle is because we won't go into depth on this concept within the guide. This is due to the fact that it's already around 20 minutes long and I recently posted an in-depth video explaining ultimate tracking, how to execute the skill, and the benefits that come along with it. If you are interested in learning or reviewing this concept, the link to the guide will be found in the description. So if nothing else, what should you make sure you get out of this guide today? For beginners, learn how Mercy's fundamental movement works and get a good feel for when it is time to heal your team or apply a damage boost. For intermediate players, begin to practice super jumping so it becomes second nature to you. Get used to prefer facing target GA settings as well as more advanced movement techniques. Set yourself up to play at your best by minimizing exposure to your enemies in the line of sight of your team. For advanced players, push your limits and learn how to really bamboozle your enemies by perfecting your movement. Furthermore, take your understanding of res further by understanding how different characters will affect the fight given by the characters your enemies are playing, how close your target is to the ultimate, and how safe the res is to begin with. And with that, you have officially completed the PAS Certified Mercy Guide. Practice makes perfect in learning every single character within Overwatch. Be sure to watch Mercy players to apply things you have learned today throughout the guide. These players include Nyandra, Skiesi, Holy Shift Kid, Somnus, and so many more. There are a ton of fantastic Mercy players out there that go beyond this list, so please educate me in the comments down below if there are any favorites I missed. I also stream from time to time on Twitch every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. If you learned anything from this guide, please do like, share, and subscribe as it helps the channel out a ton. But until next time, guys, I've got to peace out and pass out. I'll see you in the next one.